Thank you for coming to session two of our 12-week study. Get everybody to come on in. I've chosen Dr. David Reagan's um, Christ in Prophecy study guide, and I want to mention that each week because this thing goes out on YouTube, and I want to give him proper credit for that. And uh, his study guide was what I used to kind of format my way through 12 weeks, and I so appreciate his ministry and the tools he offers uh, to help do what I'm doing in this series. So again, thank you for coming and being part of session two. Last week we covered the Old Testament prophetic announcement of the first coming of the Messiah. Very briefly, I grant that. Um, I gave you the very short version of that. Tonight we will begin a study of the Old Testament prophecies of the second coming. Now I want you to understand what I just said. The Old Testament prophecies of the second coming. It will be a surprise to some of you in the room. It is my intention to get into much detail of this topic, specifically of the Old Testament, and then we're going to go to the New Testament later on in the series. But it is my intention to go deep into the detail of the prophetic announcements of the second coming of Christ. I don't think that'll be a surprise to most of you here that that's my intention. Why? Because this is our hope and this is our future. And if you don't want to talk about hope and a future, there's another class down the road somewhere you can go to. Because the hope and the future is the church. It is who we are. I began the Old Testament prophecies with an announcement by Jesus in the New Testament. Now stay with me. I'm going to start this journey by going to the New Testament and listening to what Jesus says after the resurrection. Um, this event, what I'm about to read to you, is at the very end of the book of Luke. It's after the resurrection. In fact, I'm going to start uh, in Luke 24, 35, where he's already gone and appeared to the people on the road to Emmaus. And, and then he goes back and appears to his disciples. Listen carefully to the words of Jesus because they're going to do something tonight that I can't do for you. They're going to prepare us to look at the Old Testament prophecies about the second coming in our generation. They're going to prepare us. Did Jesus say something in the church age as the church was about to be born that will help you and I understand how to read the Scriptures? Yes, I'm about to read it to you. Luke 24, 35. Then the two from Emmaus... Again, this is after the death and the burial and the resurrection, and he's going to appear to these guys on the road to Emmaus. After, then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they had recognized him as he was walking, as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, about Jesus, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said, but the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why would they think they're seeing a ghost? Because the last time they saw him, he was hanging on a cross. He's dead, and they're taking him down to bury him. Thinking they've seen a cross, a seeing a ghost, because they could imagine only the cross. Why are you frightened, Jesus asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you can see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? Then they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. And you know what I found? Most people will stop, their brain will stop reading at that point. And if your brain has stopped reading at that point, you're going to miss his big announcement. Here it comes. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you everything written about me, where? In the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. And then he does something. 
Are you ready? Here it comes. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He did something that only he can do. Did you see it? Everything written in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. When's he telling them this? In his resurrected body. He's about to begin the church age. And he's telling these people that have spent the last three years of their lives with him, they're scared to death, and he's saying, didn't I tell you that everything in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms had to be fulfilled? So if you wanted to know what was going to happen, read the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Now, here's the question. Here's the question. Is that only going to be fulfilled in the first coming? Because he's announcing it after the first coming. It wouldn't do you any good to know about the first coming after it happens, would it? So what's he talking about? What is it? Is there anything in the Old Testament, in the law, and the prophets, and the Psalms that's going to reveal not only his first coming, because it does, but it also reveals his second coming. And then he did something. Quite frankly, well, I'll explain it in a moment. He opened their minds to understand the Scripture. And that's what I'm going to pray tonight. I'm going to pray this. See, he can do that. He can come and open your mind to understand the Scriptures. He can just do it to you. He, you know, He can just do it to you. He can give you the ability to read what you read yesterday and get, didn't get. You read it today and you'll get it. He's doing it for them. And what was the context? Didn't I tell you that everything written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. It had to happen. It's unstoppable. If you'd have read and had the mind I'm about to give you, you would have known it. You'd have been prepared for it. You wouldn't be amazed that I'm standing here. You'd be thinking, yeah, I've been waiting for you. Because you knew what the Bible, what the Old Testament said in advance. So I pray that this is what's going to happen to us in this 12-week study, that the Holy Spirit will open our minds to see and understand the Scripture. Let's do that. Let's bow. Father, I ask you to do for us what Jesus did for his followers that day. He opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. Understanding that Jesus himself said that everything written in the law and the prophets and the Psalms was unstoppable. It had to be fulfilled exactly as it had been prophetically announced. So now, Lord, here we are in the church age. And we're waiting for the second coming. And we know that the law and the prophets and the Psalms are also speaking a, a, a word today. And I ask you on behalf of this church, this group, in these 12 weeks, that you would open our minds to understand the Scriptures. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This scene follows the scene of Jesus. I'm actually going into it backwards. I get that. This scene follows the scene of Jesus appearing to the man on the road to Emmaus. Notice the details of that revealing. I just read to you the revealing after he got back to Jerusalem. But what was the detail of his encounter with these guys on the road to Emmaus before he got to Jerusalem? It gets even better. Luke 24, 25. Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all the, what all the prophets, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Now look at the wording. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets. What? He's walking down the road and these guys are telling him, they don't know it's Jesus. They don't know it's him. And they're telling him the terrible thing that happened in Jerusalem today, that they killed the guy we thought was the Messiah. And Jesus says what? You foolish people. Why are they foolish? Because the Word of God had revealed that God was going to do this way before. You find it so hard to believe that the prop, what they wrote in the Scripture, wasn't it clearly predicted where? Where? Moses wrote it. 
in the prophets. I'll get into the detail on that in a minute. In the law and the prophets, he wrote in the scripture, it was clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses, one, all the prophets. Now, I don't know how much time they had on the road, but this sounds like a quite a deep Bible study to me, but maybe he can just do it like this. I have to kind of do it the hard way. He, you know, maybe he can just wave his hand, and suddenly, you know what Moses and the prophets are revealing. Explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, now they still didn't know who he was. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So we went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. Then he, break it, he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open. When were their eyes open? He gave them the bread. I would have thought their eyes would have opened when he just revealed the entire scripture to them. But their eyes, suddenly their eyes are opened and they what? They recognized him. Ooh, what a moment that was. And at that moment, he disappeared. Now, that's the sad. About the time you get it, he's gone. They recognized him, and then poof, he disappeared. Then they said to each other, please don't miss it. I highlighted it. I understood it. Then, after what? After that day's encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Christ, they didn't our hearts burn with us within us as when? As he talked with us on the road and did what? He explained the scriptures to us. In what context? What did you read above? In what context? Everything written about me had to be fulfilled. It's already in there. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11, other, the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. And actually, that's where I started this evening. Jesus said, do you find it hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the Scripture? So let's just make that personal tonight. Do you find it hard to believe all that the prophets have written in the Scriptures? <laughs> what about the Psalms? What about the writings of Moses? Do you find it hard to believe that ancient documents, and let's just put it in the light, in the time of Abraham, that for us would be 4,000 years ago. Right now, today, would you struggle with the idea that a document written 4,000 years ago in the time of Abraham is going to tell you what's coming today? Now, it's real easy to look at these knuckleheads on the road to Emmaus and think, why didn't you get it? It's real easy to look at those 11 guys in the upper room terrified and say, why didn't you get it? And what did Jesus say to both of them? It was already written down. Everything that was going to happen was written down. Can you read? So, let me repeat verse 44 from Luke. When I was with you before, I told you everything. <laughs> everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. What? Must be fulfilled. You want to know what's going to happen? Read the Bible. I remember a quote by Billy Graham. Billy Graham used to say, I get up in the morning and I read the paper to see what the, what's going on in the world. And then I read the Bible to see what it means. It's in there. Jesus groups the Old Testament prophecies into three categories. Not me, Jesus. I just read it to you. He groups it into the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The law refers to the five, first five books of the Hebrew Scripture, the books of Moses. They're referred to as the Torah. They're referred to as the Pentateuch. You in the room tonight would know them as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Psalms was not only a reference to what we know as the book of Psalms. You'd be missed if you thought his reference to the Psalms is only the book of Psalms but also to the poetic wisdom literature, including Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Now, I have inserted in, a, in a, italics um, 
David Reagan's comment, that next paragraph is actually out of his book. The prophets was a reference to the far greater volumes of literature than what we normally think of today. We think of the major and the minor prophets. The Jew of the first century used the term to refer to these books and others, which we think of as being more historical than prophetic books like what? So does the prophets include Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles? His whole point to that was we think of the prophets as the major and the minor prophets as they're lined out in, in our modern Bible. But it would not, exclu it would not exclude Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. So don't, don't think that you can write out them because they're not what we today classify as the book of prophets. Before we begin to break down the Old Testament prophecies regarding the second coming, are you with me? Old Testament prophecies, not about the first coming. It's logical that the Old Testament was going to tell you about his first coming. But what if I showed you the detail of the Old Testament prophecies talking about his second coming? I want to look at Luke 24, 44 one more time before we do that. Some people want to suggest that this verse, what I'm about to read, only refers to and was fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. But that is not what it says at all. I challenge you to read any translation you want. Luke 24, 44, and then we'll dive in. Jesus said, then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now I'm going to ask you, if you read that in the Gospel of Luke. And it's Luke chapter 24. If you know anything about Luke, that's the end of the book. That's after the death and the burial and the resurrection. Is he only talking about the first coming? No. No. So what are we saying? Everything written about me. Everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You want to know what's coming? Read the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Jesus said they must be fulfilled. We need to understand that they will all be fulfilled until the millennial reign has ended and the eternal kingdom has begun. Did you hear what I said? They will all be fulfilled. And I believe that's a reference all the way up to the eternal kingdom of Christ. Peter and Paul. So let's, let's test that against Peter and let's test that against Paul. Not that I'm trying to validate Jesus by Peter and Paul. I'm just trying to tell you that the same Holy Spirit's guiding Peter and Paul who is Christ. 1 Peter 1.8. What are we looking for? We're looking for this. Does the Old Testament law, prophet, psalms reveal the second coming? Well, Peter's writing in the church age. All right? He's not writing in the Old Testament. He's writing in the time of the church age. We live in the church age. He says, you love him, 1 Peter 1, 8. You love him, Jesus, even though you have never seen him. How many of you all seen Jesus? I have not. Face to face, I have not. But I love him. That's Peter's point. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him right now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him is going to be what? The salvation of your souls. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the reward for trusting in church. Now here it comes. This salvation was something even the prophets. Who are the prophets? This is Peter. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. This, this salvation that you and I just amened was something that even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about what? This gracious salvation prepared for you. Stay with me. They wondered, who's they? The prophets. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them, that's the Holy Spirit, within them was talking about when he told them, who? Who's them? The prophets in advance about Christ's suffering. Look, two things. About Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. Did, did you see what they found out in advance? Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. 
The suffering prophecies, what are they? They were fulfilled in the first coming. The suffering prophecies that the prophets wanted to, how, how did he word it? They, they wanted to, they wondered what time and, the, and what um, situation the Spirit of Christ was revealing. When's it going to happen and what will it look like? Now, the suffering prophecies were fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. He came as what? The suffering servant. He came as the Lamb of God, right? That's the first time. They were wondering when and what's it going to look like. Who? The prophets. The glory prophecies. What are those? I'm going to ask you, what are they? Look at the end. I'm going to read uh, verse 11 again. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told when when he the holy spirit told them the prophets in advance about Christ's suffering first coming and his great glory afterward now, i believe that's a direct reference to the second coming the great glory afterward the suffering prophecies i believe were fulfilled in the first coming of Christ and the glory prophecies will be revealed and fulfilled in the second coming now that's Peter. What about Paul? 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But there's an order to the resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when? When? When He comes back. And after, and after that, the end will come. When He... Who's he? Jesus will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is what? What? Say it out loud. Death. The end will come after Jesus turns over or delivers the kingdom to the Father. It ain't over yet. It won't be over until the last death has occurred. Can you imagine that particular sentence being realized on earth? There's a last death. Wouldn't want to be that guy. The last one to die. You know, there's a time in the history of man in which death will be finished. No one else will have it. It won't be over until the last death. So let's do something. If Jesus says that everything written about me in the law and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, let's go to the law. I want to see some of what it says. Does any of it talk about the second coming? The Torah, the law, doesn't contain very much specific prophecy about Jesus. If you go back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and do a word search for Jesus, you'll get zero. Is he not in there? You won't find specific prophecy about Jesus, the Messiah, but what it does contain is very important and significant. The very first prophecy in the Bible occurs in Genesis 3. I wonder how many of you could already say that. I think a bunch of you could. So as I read Genesis 3, so... If you read the genealogies from the Bible and take the dates from the genealogies of the Bible, I am not embarrassed to say that is some 6,000 years ago. So 6,000 years ago, Genesis chapter 3 says what I'm about to read, and I'm going to ask you before I read it, can anybody in the room see the virgin birth in Genesis 3? I can. Maybe I'm just touched, okay? I see the virgin birth 6,000 years ago. 4,000 years before the birth of Christ. What's it saying? Verse 15. And I will cause, who's I? God. I will cause hostility between you and the woman, who's you, Satan, the serpent. And between your offspring and hers, her offspring. He, the offspring of woman, will strike your head. And you will strike his heel. I see the virgin birth. Now, some of you say, well, that's a stretch. You know, it's, if it's a stretch to you, it's because you haven't read anything past Genesis 3. 
If you've read anything past Genesis, Genesis 3, it's not a stretch. Because it's very clear that what God is doing in Genesis 3 will be satisfied in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus grieves in his spirit. Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he walks to the cross. And on the cross, he, 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 he stomped the serpent's head. He crushed the serpent's head. What happened? The serpent, in that moment, struck his heel. That's a wound. But on the cross, he crushed his head. That's death. There's a difference between a wound and death. And the serpent wounded Christ. But Christ on the cross crushed. He brought death to the serpent. It's prophesied in Genesis 3. Now, now here it comes. Is the second coming in there? Stay with me. Can anybody see anything past the cross in Genesis 3? I'll ask you another question. Is Satan dead? No. Then the revelation of Genesis 3 is still coming. Because he will be. You see, in Genesis 3, there is the revelation of the crucifixion of the Messiah. But in Genesis 3, there is a revelation of an event you and I are still waiting on today. Satan will be destroyed. It's not happened yet. He will be destroyed. Death will come to him. The greatest concentration of messianic prophecy is found in the promises and the covenant between God and Abraham. No surprise there. And for some of you who maybe don't realize this, listen, I'm going to make this as clear as possible. If you hear me talk about Israel or the Hebrews or the Jews, Abraham is the first. He's the, he's the beginning. Okay? There were no Israelites, there were no Jews, there, were, there was nobody until there's Abraham. Nobody meaning God's chosen people, God's elect, until he chooses Abraham. And by the way, he specifically chose Abraham and he specifically chose Sarah. So uh, Hagar, you don't count. Ishmael, you don't count. It's the wrong fork in the tree. The greatest concentration of Messianic, that's Jesus' coming prophecies, is found in the promises and the covenants between God and Abraham, the first Jew. No surprise. Why? Because that's where he's going to create these, these special people. Genesis records this Abraham covenant some seven times. I'm only going to read the first one. It's found in Genesis 12.1. The Lord said to Abram, by the way, Abram's name was Abram before he is renamed by God to Abraham. Okay, same guy. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. By the way, which land do you think he's going to go to? <laughs> Israel. Do you think it was called Israel then? That's his grandson's name. So it's not called Israel yet. In fact, his grandson's name isn't going to be Israel until after it's Jacob. And then it'll be Israel. But it's interesting to me that God's calling him and giving him a piece of land that will bear the name of his grandson. You think Abraham knows this? Went over Abraham's head. How would he know this? Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you Singular, one guy. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. I'm going to tell you the proof that he is famous is we are sitting here talking about him right now. He is famous. I will make you famous and you'll be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through one guy. Abraham. You can find the first coming and the second coming inside these promises of God to Abraham. Can you see them? When you start reading the Bible with God's ability to open your eyes to see the Scripture, you will start to see both.
Can you see them? Let's look at spe specific promises, and then we're going to look at how to apply the second coming of Jesus. So I just listed five. You know what? I could go on and on, but I'm going to pull five. The first is Abraham to become the father of a great nation. So I'm going to ask you a question. When the first coming of Jesus, what I'm looking for is this. Can you see the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ in the Abraham covenant? Well, I will make you, uh, you'll become the father of a great nation. Well, he did. And then it fell apart. What was the condition of the great nation when Jesus' first coming happened? Stay with me. Please don't miss this. What was the condition of Israel when Jesus came the first time? There was not one. Did they have a king? Did they have a king? No. Was there a temple? Yeah, they had rebuilt it just a few years earlier. When did they rebuild it? After 70 years of being slaves in Babylon. Why were they slaves in Babylon? Because they rebelled against God. And what happened when they rebelled against God? Stay with me. The last king of Judah died. They don't have a king. So, Abraham to become the father of a great people? No, no. He says a great nation. So, can you say Abraham's covenant's not accomplished? Only if you don't understand the Scriptures. So Israel was a messed up group of nation. There really wasn't a nation when Jesus came the first time. I'm going to ask you a question. Any of you all been through the Zechariah study? Can you tell me what's going to happen when the king comes the second time? He's going to come and he's going to fight for Israel and he's going to establish his kingdom through Israel. Can you see the second coming in the Abrahamic covenant? Yeah. Number two, Abraham's descendants to be numerous as the stars in the sky. Okay, let's look at that one. Uh, they were the world superpower in the Old Testament, okay? When they came out of Egypt, two million strong, there was no nation inside of Canaan that could stand against them. Everybody feared them when they came into the land, right? They became a superpower. They took the land, fell into idolatry, and got all messed up. Well, let's fast forward. So Abraham's descendants, numerous as the dust of the st and, and stars. Uncountable. That's the whole point. You can't count them. There's so many of them. When Jesus came the first time, were they that numerous? No, they'd been scattered all over the earth. Not a whole lot of them left. I'm going to ask you a question. Did God's covenant with Abraham fail? No. I'll prove it to you. What about today? You know what? Um, I read, I don't go count people, so I will have to go by what I read, um, that I think it was a year or two ago, the census said that for the first time in history, there are more Jews living in Israel than in the United States. You think that's a coincidence? And do you know how many Jews supposedly were executed? I don't know how they know exactly. They say six million Jews were, were murdered in World War II in the Holocaust. Okay? And I believe that, by the way. So they, he had almost eradicated the Jews from Europe. If he could find you, he's going to kill you. Now there's seven million of them living inside of Israel. Not in the world, inside of Israel. So, if you've read any of, the, any of the prophecies regarding Israel leading up to the return of Christ, he's going to multiply them supernaturally. So, did God fail? No. Here's where I'm going. Do anybody see what I'm trying to do? is that we read the Old Testament like everything was finished. You can quit reading that book anymore. But if you quit reading that book, much of what God's still doing today in re reference to the second coming of Christ is still in the process of being fulfilled right now. He's not done. It ain't over yet. Number three, through Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
Are you a Gentile? See, I believe that, let me say this, I believe the United States of America is the fulfillment of that sentence. Why? Because even in modern time, there has been no greater ally to the nation of Israel than the United States. In 1948, on May 14th, 1948, when the Israeli prime minister stood up and proclaimed the world that Israel was a, an independent nation, he proclaimed their sovereignty. Do you know who the first world leader was to announce his support for Ben-Gurion's announcement? President Truman. Within minutes. Within minutes of Prime Minister Ben-Gurion's announcement, Truman comes in front of the world and says, we acknowledge the state of Israel as a sovereign nation. Well, who's going to... Who's going to say, no, we don't now? Well, the Arab nations didn't, and they couldn't stop it. You see, it's being fulfilled. If you stopped reading the Old Testament because the new one came out, then you'll never understand it's still happening right now. Number four. This one it gets really interesting. This one it's in today's news, by the way. The land of Canaan will become special and given to Abraham's family as an eternal possession. Anybody watch any of the nonsense of the United Nations? You are really bored if you did. But in reality, there is a push to divide the land of Israel and give it to the Arab states, to the Palestinians. It's not ours to give. It was given in that Abrahamic, in that Abrahamic covenant has that been fulfilled is that all over can you just say well we got the new covenant we got the new testament right we don't need to read the old anymore are you starting to see it it's it's not finished yet it ain't over yet in fact well i'll, I'll get ahead of myself number five god will bless those who bless abraham's descendants and he'll curse those who curse them that's in the abraham covenant That's an easy one. That's why I dread the day that the United States ever pulls away from Israel. I dread the day. Because quite frankly, I believe that will be the last straw, the end. It'll be over. Can you see the first and second coming in those five promises of God to Abraham? Has God done to you what he did to those guys on the Emmaus Road? Has he done to you what he did to those 11 guys in the upper room who were scared to death they saw a ghost? He revealed the Scriptures. What? Everything written in the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms about me must be fulfilled. And it ain't over yet. That's it. Now, let's do something. Let's look for some specific second coming prophecies in the Torah. Okay, let's get specific. In Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not generalized. Let's look at some specifics. So I'm going to read several of them. This first one is the Song of Moses after they crossed the Red Sea. If you crossed the Red Sea, you'd sing a song too. Okay? I'm not sure the quality of the music, but you'd sing a song. Here's the song. With your unfailing love, you led, you led the people you have redeemed. You lead the people you have redeemed. In your might. Now, now, please don't get caught up in the story. Can you see the second coming of Jesus in the Song of Moses coming out of Egypt? You have redeemed. In your might, you, you guide them to your sacred home. <laughs> let me start all over with your unfailing love you lead the people you have redeemed well, what's happening right now he's just god's just sent moses into egypt how long have they been in egypt 400 years there's nobody 400 years old okay in there so do any of those people in egypt ever have they any of them ever been to canaan did they take a mission trip to canaan one time they never they don't know where canaan's at okay so where, where's Moses? God took 
Moses and he sent them into Egypt and he's going to take these people. Where are they going? They're going to Canaan. Can Canaan is Israel. Okay? Whose home is it? Anybody seeing it yet? Whose home is it? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <clears throat> With your unfailing love, you lead the people you have redeemed. That's Israel. He's going to break their bondage in Egypt, right? In your might, you guide them to your sacred home. Whose sacred home? To your sacred home. Moses is talking to God. God lives there? Stay with me. The people, the peoples along the way, hear and tremble, anguish grips those who live in Philistia. The leaders of Edom are terrified. The nobles of Moab tremble. Why is everybody all shook up for? Because Israel's coming. Where are they going? Home. Who's home? God's home. You know who lives in God's home? God's children. You think it's a good idea to stop the children from going home where God lives? Listen to what he says. The leaders of Edom are terrified. The nobles of Moab tremble. All who live in Canaan melt away. Terror and dread fall upon them. The power of your arm makes them lifeless as stone until your people pass by, O oh Lord, until the people you purchased pass by. What is everybody so afraid for? You think it's Moses doing that? It's not Moses doing that. Here it goes. I love this part. You will bring them in. Moses is singing a song. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O oh Lord, reserved for your own dwelling. Is there a temple over there? No. Is there a mountain over there? Yeah. Anybody want to know what happened on that mountain? Some of you do. You remember that first guy, Abraham? You know what he did on that mountain where this temple is going to be? He took his only son, Isaac, and he raised a knife to offer him as a sacrifice. That's where they're going. They don't know it, but that's where they're going. That temple is going to be built on that piece of ground where Abraham offered his son Isaac. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, reserved for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign. How long? How long? How long? Forever. This is an eternal kingdom he's announcing. This is not something that's going to, well, the Romans came and they just shut the whole thing down. Sorry, Abraham. Sorry, Moses. So I'm asking you a question again. Can anybody see the second coming of Jesus in here? This is a forever kingdom in Jerusalem. Stay with me. Can you see it? Your own mountain. It's a reference to Jerusalem before they ever get to Jerusalem. And how long will this people of God dwell in Jerusalem? Forever and ever. It ain't over yet. The Lord will reign in Jerusalem. Is it over? Is that is what I just read to you proclaiming the second coming of Christ? Do you have eyes to see the scriptures? Now li listen carefully to what I'm about to say. What's, where's Jesus going to come back to? Zechariah chapter 14. I hope I drilled it into you Zechariah study people enough. His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, right? He's going to begin to reign in Jerusalem. How long? Well, the Bible says he's going to reign. If you're a literal reader of the Bible, I happen to be one of those guys. It says that he's going to reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Then what? Everybody goes to heaven? Then you didn't read Revelation chapter 21. So I'll tell you what it says. And then I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth. Now, if there's a new heaven and a new earth, what happened to the first one? The first heaven, that would be what I look up at. And what happened to the one I'm standing on? I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw what? 
I saw the holy city, the new, Jer the new what? The new Jerusalem descending as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. What? How long is Jesus going to reign in Jerusalem? How long, church? Forever. Now that Jerusalem, literally speaking, seems to me to be on the earth for a thousand years. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And then there's going to be a Jerusalem descent. And you know what it says next in the next sentence in Revelation 21? It says, now the dwelling place of God is with man. For how long? For how long? Forever. I said that to somebody years ago and they were like, you mean, you mean heaven's going to be on the earth? And I said, do you have a problem with geography? Do you really care if heaven is on the recreated earth or no? I was really hoping we'd go there. Where's there? I'll tell you where heaven's going to be. Wherever Jesus reigns. That's heaven. So look at the second one. There's no way I'll get through this tonight. Now notice the third and the fourth prophecies of Balaam. Now, now are you with me? Y'all know the prophecies of Balaam? As Moses is leading these people out of Egypt, they're going to Israel, what will be called Israel, and this bunch of bad guys get a prophet named Balaam to curse Israel because everybody's scared to death of them. But Balaam can't do it. That's where Balaam's donkey comes in and donkey talks and all that. I don't have time to go into all that. But Balaam gives prophecies. God just consumes Balaam, and out of Balaam's mouth comes God's prophecy. Can anybody see the second coming of Jesus in Balaam's prophecy before they ever get to Israel, before they ever get to the promised land? Well, let's look. Numbers 24. And this is the message he delivered, Balaam. This is the message of Balaam, son of Beor, the message of the man whose eyes see clearly, the message of the one who hears the words of God who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob! How lovely are your homes, O Israel! They spread before me like palm groves, like gardens by the riverside. They are like tall trees planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets. Their offspring have all they need. Their king will be greater than Agag, their kingdom will be exalted. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I read that, and I read that in context of everything else I have learned from the Scriptures, this is not a reference to the glorious kingdom of King David. As glorious as that kingdom was in Israel, this is a reference to what he's going to do when the king of kings will come. The kingdom will be exalted. Now, I'm going to tell you why I say that. Now, let's go down to verse 17. I see him. This is, this is Balaam's prophecy. I see him, but not here. Not now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. Who is this guy? It will crush the foreheads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Edom will be taken over, and Seir, its enemy, will be conquered, while Israel marches on in triumph. A ruler will rise in Jacob, who will destroy the survivors of Ur. Then Balaam looked over toward the people of Amalek, and he delivered this message. By the way, Amalek had hired him to give him a good word. It didn't work out very well. Amalek was the greatest of nations, but its destiny is destruction. So li listen, before I read, let me tell you, this prophecy is against the Gentile kingdoms of man. Hear what I'm saying. It's a prophecy against the Gentile kingdoms of man that do not align themselves with Abraham. Did you hear what I said? 
It is the prophecy even today of the Gentile kingdoms of man that refuse to align themselves with Abraham. Does that mean align yourself politically with the nation of Israel? That's not what I said. I said align yourself with Abraham because those who will be saved will be those who are, found, who are the children of God. And the children of God will be those who call Abraham father. We have been grafted into this tree that tree's root is Abraham. That tree is the tree of life. That tree is God's children. And the Gentile kingdoms, what I'm about to read to you, is a picture of the Gentile kingdoms that refuse to align themselves with Abraham. Now, let me say it. Amalek was the greatest of nations, but its destiny is destruction. Then he looked over toward the Kenites and he delivered this message. Your home is secure. Your nest is set in the rocks, but the Kenites will be destroyed when Assyria takes you captive. Balaam concluded his message by saying, Alas, who can survive unless God has wielded it? Ships will come from the coast of Cyprus. They will oppress Assyria and afflict Eber, but they too will be utterly destroyed. Every Gentile kingdom that does not eventually align itself with the man, the people, the children of Israel will be destroyed. Balaam's prophecy describes the glory of Israel during the millennial kingdom of Christ. Are you with me? I believe Balaam's prophecy are an announcement of the glory of Israel during, during the 1,000-year millennial kingdom of Christ. And it also describes the time when God will judge the nations, the Gentile nations, that have opposed Israel, specifically during the Great Tribulation. Number three, the speech of Moses while he's in the land of Moab. By the way, Moses did not cross over the Jordan River, did he? He's in Moab. This is one of his final farewell addresses. Is the second coming of Christ prophesied in what I'm about to read? Deuteronomy 4.30. In the distant future, when you are suffering all these things, you will finally return to the Lord your God and listen to what He tells you. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the solemn covenant He made with your ancestors. The time of suffering in Deuteronomy 4 is a description of Israel, I believe, during the tribulation. And the deliverance of Israel at the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes to fight on their behalf to deliver them from the nations, from the Antichrist that will rise against them. It ain't over yet. Number four, the song of Moses at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. He liked to sing a lot and wrote them down. This song reveals the future Messiah as the rock. And the song also reveals the unfaithfulness of Israel and God's decision to allow their kingdom to fall and eventually scattering them as exiles among the nations. Deuteronomy 32. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything He does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright is He. Could you say that was fulfilled in the first coming of Christ? Yes. Can you say, is it over? No. Deuteronomy 32, 15. But Israel soon became fat and unruly. The people grew heavy, plump, and stuffed. Then they abandoned the God who made them, and they made light of the rock of their salvation. They stirred up His jealousy by worshiping foreign gods. They provoked His fury with detestable deeds. They offered sacrifices to demons which are not God, to gods they have not known before, to new gods only recently arrived, to gods their ancestors had never feared. You neglected the rock who had fathered you. You forgot the God who had given you birth. Is this a description of Israel? I'm going to tell you, most of the Jewish people who live in Israel today are atheists. So if you have this imagination, if you have this idea that the Jews in Israel are some holy people because they are righteous unto God, you'd be wrong. Are, are there some that are? Yes. Are there some devout Orthodox Jews? Yes. But as a nation, overall, 
are the Jews in Israel are living in unbelief. Unbelief of the Messiah, Jesus, who was Jewish, by the way, and unbelief of the laws of God, even. It's a ritual. Many people who claim to be Jews just do it as a lifestyle, not as a worship of God. And what I'm reading to you, they have neglected the God of their salvation. Is he going to reject them totally? Not totally. Not totally. How? Why? Deuteronomy 32, verse 21. Now we're going to connect the dots to the New Testament. They have roused my jealousy by worshiping things that are not God. They have provoked my anger with their useless idols. Now I will rouse their jealousy through people who are not even a people. I will provoke their anger through the foolish Gentiles, through us. Is it over? In the church age. One of my most fond stories from Israel, and I'll try to make this short because there's no way I'm going to get through all this anyway. I met a guy, a Messianic Jew, who told me the story how he came to Christ. I love this guy. His name is uh, Ave Miserachi. And Ave had a sister who had become a Christian. And because she became a Christian, they didn't talk to each other, and she tricked him. And she invited him to the United States. He lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. She invited him to, to the United States to visit. He was staying at her house. And he thought, it was a Sunday, and he thought that they were going somewhere as a family for lunch. She took him to church in Atlanta. I think it was, no, I don't know, somewhere at, either in Georgia or Florida. I don't remember. He was furious. He told me I was so mad. But out of the respect for my sister, I sat there. I was so mad. And then he said, something happened. Here's his words. She provoked me to jealousy. I thought of the scripture. He said, I, a Jew, saw these Christian Gentiles. I saw them worshiping Yahshua, the Jewish Messiah. And it provoked me to jealousy. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy of Moses. He became a Christian. He now leads one of maybe the largest Messianic Jewish outreaches in Israel today. This church supports him monthly, financially. Now, with that said, let me read Romans 11, 11. This is New Testament, right? Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. Are they beyond recovery? No. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. That's us in this room. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I'm sorry for your luck, you guys who were disobedient, but I'm glad we got in. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will, not maybe, will share when they finally accept it. Because they're going to. They're going to. In the end, they're going to. I am saying all this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as an apostle to the Gentiles. I stress this. For I want somehow to make the people of Israel jealous of what you Gentiles have so that I might save some of them. I think Ave Miserachi, he got you. For since their rejection meant that God offered salvation to the rest of the world, their acceptance, not maybe, it's going to happen. It's prophesied. Their acceptance will be even more wonderful. It'll be life to those who were dead. And since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants will also be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be too. Can't you see it? Can't you see it? Anybody seeing it? Raise your hand. Some of the rest of you fake it. Makes me feel better. (laughs) I've got a story I've got to tell you before we leave. Moses was used by God to establish the tabernacle 
and the Jewish feast. That last page is the Jewish feast. I won't have time to go through it tonight. But I've got to show you this last thing. That tabernacle and those feasts reveal Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. If you were here last week, I showed you everything in the tabernacle. Everything in the tabernacle cries out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I got one more. This one's going to blow your socks off. Have you ever thought about the mercy seat, the very throne of God in the tabernacle? I want you to create a visual image. In the Holy of Holies, there is a box. It's covered by gold. Inside of that are those items, the, the jar of manna, Aaron's staff that budded, the law. It's all Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But listen, listen. There's a gold box, and on top of the gold box, there are two cherubim. And they are described specifically as angels with outstretched wings facing each other. Okay, so you have this gold box with a lid. It's called the mercy seat. It is the throne of God, okay? And angels looking at each other with their wings spread out. Did that event, did that mercy seat with the angels say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? Yes. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But when Mary goes to the tomb of Jesus, she saw angels standing on each end of the mercy seat where Jesus' body was laid. Let me read it to you, if I can. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked inside. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other sitting at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been laying, the throne of God. In the tabernacle, in the most holy place that could only be approached with blood and only by the high priest and only one time a year, and that was fulfilled that day in that tomb when Jesus laid there and angels are on both sides of him and his body lays there. He is the throne of God. He is the mercy seat. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It is announced and revealed with Moses and the tabernacle 1,500 years before he's born in Bethlehem. It ain't over yet. So I'm going to tell you how to read this chart so you can go home and look at it. Blow you away when you get it. I hope you get eyes to say, I wish I had time. If I hadn't got so carried away, I could have finished this. The Passover. The Passover is the crucifixion of Christ. The Old Testament reveals the Jesus. But look at the unleavened bread. It's the burial of Jesus. Because notice something. The Passover, look at the calendar on top. It happens on the 14th day. And then on the 15th through the 21st day is unleavened bread. So if the Passover was when Jesus was put to death, on the third day there is a seed that must go into the earth before it can live. The seed is planted in the ground. I am the bread of life. But look at the next one. The first fruits are the resurrection. When did the first fruits happen? If you looked at the Jewish calendar, when did they have to celebrate the first fruits? On the first Sunday following the Passover. What happened on the first Sunday following the Passover? Jesus rose from the dead. When was he put in the grave? During the Passover, during the celebration of the unleavened bread. It gets better. 50 days is between the first fruits and the harvest. 50 days. How long was it between that event and the day of Pentecost? What's Pentecost mean? 50. What happened on Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. My point is this. Every one of the Jewish festivals cries out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Even the dates that they were cal by the calendar instructed to observe them. They were all fulfilled by Jesus by the church in the church age. It ain't over yet. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that will believe. And I pray as we go through this study that you would continue to reveal your glory, the glory of your Son, the glory of what's coming to your church. Make us ready in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here.